Good afternoon. How is everyone doing this afternoon, okay? Okay. The topic for this afternoon that I've been given to share with you is the corporal works of mercy. And it's very, very important, and it's very, very much related to, to the talk that I gave yesterday, and I'm going to go into the details about it. The big, big point of it does come from Matthew 25, and the list that Jesus gives in Matthew 25 really touches upon the church's tradition of the corporal works of mercy. But I'd like to spend a little bit of time with you getting into uh, some of the details of that. I'd like to start first with mercy itself. And when you get a basic, basic definition of the word mercy, what you get is compassionate treatment. That's what mercy is, compassionate treatment. And as you know, the word compassion comes from the Latin compassio, which means to suffer with. So the corporal works of mercy are not about, it's not about having pity for someone. Like you say, oh, that poor person, you know? Where, you know how sometimes people see somebody who, if you see somebody in the street who's homeless, or if you hear about a bed, a lot of times people go, oh, isn't that terrible? Now, that's our hearts kind of going out, but we're not, we're not really suffering much with that person, you know? It's almost like, it's almost having, a, having pity on that person. You know, and if you have pity, it could almost be kind of condescending, kind of looking down on someone and saying, oh, I'm so sorry to see you like that, you know. And so it's not the, but compassion to suffer with, oh, that's a whole nother story. And that's what the corporal works of mercy are rooted in. When you look at the list of what they are, let me just jump ahead and tell you what they are. Feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and imprisoned, and burying the dead. The first four of them come directly from Jesus in Matthew 25. And then the last one is added, burying the dead. And you know, to suffer with those who are suffering from hunger, from homelessness, from being naked, from being sick or being imprisoned, to suffer with them is quite a different thing than going... Oh, I'm so sorry about that. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not making fun of people who do that, you know, because sometimes that's the way of them expressing some kind of feeling or, or, or sentiment towards them. But that's not enough. It's really not enough. You know, for every time, we, for every, you know, we should have a dollar. That's about three dollars right there. So if you go, oh, that poor hungry person, that's three dollars. And if you go, that's about $7. That's about $7 right there. But if you don't know any hungry people, and if you don't know where to bring some food, I know some people here have been cooking up a storm. Man, I ate some beautiful, beautiful sweets, those fruit muffins and little uh, ginger crisps and all that other stuff. You know, if you can bake it, and, and the soup, I had pumpkin soup that was out of this world. So if you can make a really great pumpkin soup, then make a pot of soup and bring it somewhere and give it to somebody. You know, if there's a shelter, do something. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to go, that's three meals. So if you don't want to give any money, say, so that's three meals. Or if it's a homeless person, you're going to go, okay, that's pants, shirt, and shoes. You know? Think like that. You know, if you're going to say, okay, 10, 20, 30, that's $10 a, for the, to bury the dead. And if you don't know where to send the money, I'll leave my address. Send me a U.S. dollar note to the Bronx and give it to me because I'll put it to good use. So, and find somebody here in New Zealand. Find out where the hungry people are. Find out where there's people that have too many people in their homes. And instead of just sending them money or a check, make a meal. They can freeze it. And if they don't have a freezer, find out when they're going to eat it fresh and bring it hot right off the plate. You know? But that's, that's what it's going to take. And then that's, that, then that's more of the spirit of compassion. But mercy is compassionate treatment. And it means to suffer with. Mercy is also a disposition to be kind and forgiving. Oh, boy. Just kindness. Kindness. You know the difference between meeting a kind person and not meeting a kind person, even on the telephone? Do you ever get a kind operator and a not-so-kind operator? Big difference, right? That's related to mercy. You can say, hi, I'm looking for somebody. I think the... 
His name is Father Stan. He's in New York. I don't really know what his last name is. Now, an unkind operator is going to be, well, there's 100,000 Father Stans in New York. And if you don't have a last name, what do you think I am? God? You know? <laughs> or if you find a kind operator, you're going to say, hi, I'm, uh, I want Father Stan's number. He's in uh, New York. Okay, honey, do you know where in New York he is? Um, I think the Bronx. Okay. Do you have a last name? No. Well, gee, honey, I, I don't think I can help you. you know? There's probably a lots of Father Stan's. If you, get the, if you get a last name, please call me back. You know, instead of saying, stupid, you got to give me his last name. How do you think I'm going to find him? There's a thousand father stands, right? And it can come in the most simplest ways. Somebody at the store, when you, if you're going to buy a bottle of water, and you go buy a bottle of water, say, yes, I'd like to have a bottle of water, please. It's one dollar. <laughs> you know? And now to be compassionate, right then at that point there, we'd, be, we'd say, how are you today? Fine, thank you. You know, or as if you see so, oh, would that be all? Yes, please, that's all, just a bottle of water. You know, and the little things like that. A little bit of kindness goes a long way. That's one of the major attributes of God himself. He is all merciful. He is compassionate. He is kind. He is kind and merciful. Another quality of mercy is a blessing. And what did Jesus say? Blessed are the merciful, for mercy shall be theirs. So in order for us to get a feel and to get an accurate sense of what the corporal mercy, the, what the corporal works of mercy are, it's very, very important for us to get an accurate and an authentic sense of what mercy is, of who mercy is. Because Jesus is the mercy of God. And in Ephesians chapter 4, no, chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, the Bible tells us this. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in sin. Oh boy, isn't that good news? Even when we were dead in our sin. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. That's so awesome. While we were dead, He made us alive. It's like a mini resurrection. It's like an early resurrection. While we were dead in our sins, He made us alive in Christ because God is rich in mercy. And our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, whom you know by now ad nauseum, is my personal hero. And I never tire of saying that, and I mean it. He's my personal hero. He's also, the, you know, the hero of our community, too. He wrote a whole encyclical. It was his second one. And what did he call it? God is rich in mercy is the English translation. And he took it right out of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. And in that encyclical, the Holy Father says that love is mercy's second name. And so when you see how important love is and how important charity is, God is love. Jesus is God. Christ is the incarnation of love and mercy. You can see how important it is. Now the church teaches us in the New Catechism number 2444 that the church's love for the poor is part of her constant tradition. It's part of her constant tradition. The church's love for the poor is part of her constant tradition. We have so many saints throughout the century. We have so many, throughout the centuries, we have so many people living now who are so devoted to the care of the poor. And of course, we've just lost from our celest uh, terrestrial view a great one, Mother Teresa, and her sisters are still carrying on that mission and that work with great love for Jesus in the poor all over the world, the missionaries of charity. And that's nothing new. And it's part of her constant 
tradition. That's big. That's big. So in order for us to really have a more authentic and an appropriate love for the church, we must. We must have some, in some way, in some shape, in some form, we must have a love for the poor. It's not an option. It's not an option. And so, if it's not your strong point, okay, it can be a weak point, but it's got to be a point. That's the point. We've got to make it a point, you know. If it's not your strong point, that's okay. If it, as long as it's a weak point, as long as it's a point, that's the point. We've got to make it a point. It's not an option, you know. And the church continues that it extends not only to material poverty. Now, the church is, I was saying yesterday in a different way what I'm saying today from quoting the catechism. It extends, the church's love for the poor, not only to material poverty, but also to the many forms of cultural and religious poverty. So this is big. And to have a love for the poor, not pity for the poor, but love for the poor, which is going to express itself in compassion, which means to suffer with. And which means that we are bound by our tradition and we are bound by the Word of God. And that's the Catholic position. Word of God, Scripture, and tradition is the Catholic position. Uh-oh, I'm having a rap attack. Good thing the drums are gone. You know, but it's true. Scripture and tradition is the Catholic position. You see that? So there you go. And it's not an option. Matter of fact, rather than just reducing this love for the poor to an option, the church talks about the preferential option for the poor. It's actually preferred. So if it's not your strong point, you got to make sure it's at least a weak point. And that's the point. It's got to be somewhere, somehow. So if there's nothing going on, then you got to get something started. And if you got something going on in your life where you're able to do something, say, well, Father, I'm very busy. I, don't talk to me about being busy. Believe me. <laughs> you, you, can't, uh, you, you won't get no ground on that one. And if you say, well, Father, I don't have much money. Don't talk to me about having much money. I take a vow of poverty. On the one hand, I have no money. But on the other hand, that's where I get all my money from. People donate and people give. And God provides. Don't worry. Mother Teresa said, well, God has a lot of money. <laughs> and people would write Mother Teresa $100,000 checks. Would, people would write Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, what do you need? You need a building? Don't worry. She goes, yeah, I want the building right there. <laughs> Boom! They would come with their checkbook. Bing, 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 right at the check. Build the building. I, I, no, I don't want it that way. I want it this way. She was very tough. She was one little tough cookie, Mother Teresa great story about Father Benedict working with Mother Teresa in New York when Cardinal Cook was still, uh, still the Archbishop, the Cardinal Archbishop of New York. And Father Benedict uh, worked very closely with uh, Cardinal Cook, whose cause for beatification, he is the uh, 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 postulator for the cause of the beatification of Cardinal Cook. And he still works very closely with uh, our, uh, Cardinal O'Connor in New York. And when Mother Teresa, you know, w was in town and she wanted another convent, so Cardinal Cook told Father Benedict to go show Mother Teresa the convent. So he says, Mother, I'm going to you know, take and show you the convent. And they went in the South Bronx, and she looked at the convent. She goes, no. No? No. What's the matter? It's not good for us. So Father Benedict goes back to the convent and says, she said no. Why'd she say no? Because it's not good for us. Then he shows her another one. And she goes, yes, we'll take this one. She said she'll take that one. Okay, very good. Then she goes inside. She says, all the rugs, all the furniture, everything, take it all out. Everything, whoop, whoop, out the window. All the curtains, all the rugs, all the furnishings, out the window. Oh, yeah. She was a tough cookie. But she had a vision. And she certainly teaches us how to have compassion and how to have mercy and to show that mercy uh, for the poor. 
Now, let's get to the corporal works of mercy themselves. In the catechism, number 2447, I like to call it the CCC, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I refer to it as the CCC. I saw some copies back there at, at a bookstore. As a matter of fact, in New Zealand and in Australia, you have a wonderful, wonderful paperback version of that. If you don't have it, get it. And if you have it, read it. And if you read it, read it again. It's an absolutely awesome book. So take it home with you. So that's my little TV commercial for the, for the church. See? If you don't have it, get it. If you have it, read it. And if you read it, read it again. There's a number of ways to read the catechism. One is from cover to cover. So if you've never done that, read it from cover to cover. And make it a project. And speed read it. Just go whoop, right through the whole thing, cover to cover. Another way to read the catechism is when there's a certain topic that you need to kind of look up. It's got a, a decent index in the back. And you can look it up in the back, and you'll find wonderful things back there. And another way to read the catechism is just pick it up and open it. Just pick it up. Almost like Bible, you know how you do Bible roulette? You know, you say a prayer to the Holy Spirit, and you open up the Bible, and you let God speak to you. You can do the same with the catechism. Just take it and open it and read it. And go flipping through it and see what you see. And it's amazing. Every time I open it up, I'm, I'm amazed every time. And what the church says about the works of mercy in number 2447 is this. Charitable actions by which we come to the aid of our neighbor in his spiritual and bodily necessities. That's what works of mercy are. Works of mercy are charitable actions by which we come to the aid of our neighbor in his spiritual and bodily necessities. And then there's two lists. There's the spiritual works of mercy and there's the corporal works of mercy. And, I was, and as I was reviewing this, I'm saying to myself, my goodness, I, I'm 24-7 with these things. Listen to the spiritual works of mercy. Instructing. Instructing. So even when you're instructing your children, if you're a teacher, you're involved in, the spiritual, in a spiritual work of mercy. Advising. If you're going to give advice to someone, you're involved with the spiritual work of mercy. If you're consoling someone, you're involved with a spiritual work of mercy. If you're comforting someone, you're involved with a spiritual work of mercy. Now we're getting really heavy here. When you're forgiving someone, you're involved in an awesome spiritual work of mercy. And even more intensely and lastly, when you're bearing wrongs patiently. Ah. Can you please repeat after me? Bearing wrongs patiently. Repeat. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You, you could put on your refrigerator, CCC, number 2447, number 6. That's the sixth spiritual work of mercy. <laughs> Bearing wrongs patiently. Oh. <clears throat> you want to have some compassion? <laughs> oh, to bear the wrongs of another patiently. Then the corporal works of mercy, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and imprisoned, and burying the dead. Maybe the, one of the most easiest ones for some of you to do would be just that, to visit the sick. Those who you know are not feeling well, if you don't like going to hospitals, and do you have nursing homes in New Zealand or old age homes? Oh man, there you go. Early on in my conversion, the Lord had me. I had more grandmas than I could, and they're in heaven now, boy, and they are praying for me. I have, I have a host of grandmas and grandpas in heaven. Because when I first had my conversion, the Lord brought me to this old age home. And it was very interesting. They see this young, you know, Dapper Dan guy come in, because I was a musician at that time, you know, and all the nurses were like, is that your grandson? Is that your grandson? Is that your grandson? Is that your grandson? And they're saying, all these nurses want to know if you're my grandson. I said, of course I'm your grandson. I had all these grandmas. It was unbelievable. Go visit somebody in the nursing home. Say, well, I don't know who they are, and I'm ashamed. Knock it off. Stop that. Don't put up with that for one second. 
Take the plunge. Go. Go. You don't have to know in order to go so that you can show the world that you... Uh, don't get me started. <laughs> but you don't have to know in order to go. Just go. And what you may have to do is speak to someone at the front desk and say, Hi, I'd like to visit someone. Now they might say, All right, well, you have to get fingerprinted, you have to go for a class, and you have to pay $5 to be a volunteer. All right. So you bear patiently with the wrongs of this scenario. <laughs> practice a little spiritual work of mercy in order to get you the ticket to practice a corporal work of mercy. Yeah? Yeah. And then you go. I'm telling you, you will get more than you ever get. You know, you might find some old, crazy old grandma sitting in a wheelchair that all she can do is that. Did you ever see sometimes when folks get old and see now, they just sit there and they're like, da, 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 da. But you walk up to them and say, hi, da, da, da. All right, so you sit there and you talk to her. And if all she's doing, da, 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 then you just kind of sit there and talk with her. How are you? Nice to see. What's your name? Oh, and you find out her name. And if her name is, oh, Lucy, hi, Lucy. And you know, she, she might get really nasty with you or something like that. She might go, da, da, da. <laughs> if she does that, you take your hanky out and you go like this. Wow, Lucy, that was a good shot there, honey. That was a good shot, Lucy. You know, and then she goes, da, da, da. I say, okay. Bye, Lucy. I got to go now. And that might be the last time you visit Lucy. Then you try somebody else. <laughs> My grandmother was in a nursing home. And, it, and, and, and in Greek, you call grandma yaya. So I had a yaya and a papu. That's grandma and grandpa in Greek. And I had a nonna and a nonno. That's grandma and grandpa in Italian. So I had a yaya, papu, a nonna, and a nonno. So now you know why I'm so cuckoo. And they're all in heaven, I hope, praying for me. My yaya, my papu, my nonna, and my nonna, and all of my adopted yayas. So I have many, many yayas and papus in heaven, praying for me. Oh, yes, so you can blame them. But go to the nursing home. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your time. I used to go see my yaya when she was there. And she never wanted to go out. I said, yaya, come on, we're going to go out. No, no, I'm sick. I didn't take no for an answer. I went and I got her shoes and I put them right on her feet. She goes, no, no, no. She was going like, come on, come on, come on, come on. But she was going, no, no, because old folks get funny, you know. She said she didn't want to go out. Of course she wanted to go out. And I took her out and she thought she died and went to heaven. And I found out what her favorite thing was. She had no teeth. <laughs> and you had to see this woman munch down three pieces of New York pizza. <laughs> and then every time I said, I said, yeah, yeah, come on, let's go out. She goes, no, no. You know, first it was like, no, no, no. And then it was like, no. She was a peasant woman from the mountains. You know, she couldn't read. She, could, she was an amazing, amazing woman. She loved to go out. You find out what their favorite thing is. It's an awesome thing, an awesome thing to do. And I got news for you. You're going to get so much more than you're going to give, you know. And maybe some of you can go to the prison. That's a little bit more difficult. Not everybody's comfortable doing that. Maybe some of you, if you find out that, that a family has a death in the family, maybe they have insurance and they have enough of money to care for that. But if you know who they are, I mean, in, in the Italians, we have a tradition. Whenever somebody in the family dies and there's a death, somebody's cooking, bring, bringing food over, and everybody's taking care of everybody, and don't worry. So if you find out somebody has a death in the family, Make a pot of something. Don't call up and say, would you like me to make a pot of stew? Don't ask them. Show up with the stew. You know? Can I help? Maybe, maybe bring some bread or something. Don't ask. Show up with the bread. And if they have too much bread, believe me, they'll invite, the people are going to eat it. This way they don't have to cook. And if they're cooking it, they'll put it in the freezer and then throw it in the microwave. Or if they don't have a microwave, they'll let it thaw out and it'll be ready to eat in about an hour. Don't ask. Just do it. But you can be involved, even with burying the dead. You don't have to come and do the money. You don't have to, get, you don't have to give money necessarily. You don't have to necessarily get a shovel and dig the grave. 
but you can maybe cook a meal. And instead of a phone call, what about showing up and visiting? Much more easy, especially you got your cell phone. You know, you can be walking around the house, you can be driving, you can be in the mall shopping. Hi, how you doing? Okay, very good, bye-bye. I mean, that's good that you call, but how about just showing up for a visit? Or maybe asking. You might want to ask, do you mind if I come by? And they say, well, not now. Or just show up. And when you walk in, you say, oh, hi. You say, oh, this isn't a good time. Well, I just wanted to come by. I'll come back. And you leave. Showing up is better than just a phone call. So there's many, many ways that we can practice the corporal works of mercy. And if you want to feed the, the, the hungry and you don't know what to do, pick up the telephone. Look in the phone book. Call the, call the, 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 talk to the bishop and say, Bishop, is there any groups? Talk to one of the nuns. Is there any community? Is there somebody anywhere doing something for the poor in, in, in Auckland? Hello, help me. Anybody anywhere doing anything for the poor? Who are they? Where are you? Stand up. And believe me, if you ask, you'll find out. You'll find out. And what a great thing. You know, because believe me, as somebody who, who used to be, I used to be the director of the shelter, and our community is responsible for many of these things, you can get involved in the mystery of the divine providence of our Heavenly Father. And then you watch what happens to your life. You think you're holy now? Huh, you'll be glowing in the dark. <laughs> you'll be glowing in the dark. And if you think, well, I'll never be holy, I'll never be holy, well, you better do something about that, you know? If you can say, I, I can't make myself holy, that, change your language. Don't say, I'll never be holy, I'll never be holy. No, just say, I can't make myself holy, I can't make myself holy, that's true. And then pray, say, oh, God, make me holy, God, make me holy. Good! Then you're crying out for mercy. That's the key. And then as we learn to cry out for his mercy, we'll stop getting stuck on ourselves. That's a great freedom. God will release us from being stuck on ourselves. And then we will be able to be open to him. And then we, we will be able to move in that movement of freedom, of his grace, of his sanctifying grace, his actual grace, of his Holy Spirit. And then we will be sanctified to recognize the mystery of his face in all of these situations. And sisters and brothers, it's beautiful. It's awesome. It's what we need in our lives to awaken our worship. It's what we need in our lives to authenticate our reception of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ in the awesome, most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. And it's what we need to authentic our worship and our adoration of Jesus Christ, truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most awesome mystery of the Blessed Sacrament. The church continues to teach in the CCC, number 2447, among all these, among all these things, giving alms to the poor is one of the chief witnesses to fraternal charity. And there's a major qualification here. And this is an interesting twist to all of this. It is also a work of justice. And it's pleasing to God. Remember I was talking about the and kind of pity party sometimes that we go on with people? That's not compassion. And you know, sometimes we might think, well, it's a sense of charity, yes, but there's the J word, justice. Listen to what some of our saints have to say about this. First of all, the church is teaching us that it's pleasing to God. But listen to what St. John Chrysostom says. And the church quotes this great father of the church in the catechism. Not to enable the poor to share in our goods is to steal from them. Not to enable the poor to share in our goods is to steal from them and to deprive them of life. And the church continues, the demands of justice must be satisfied first of all. That which is already due in justice is not 
to be offered as a gift of charity. Oh, my. And that's right in that little dynamite book called The Catechism of the Catholic Church. I wonder how many Catholics read that line. You know, it's almost like, oops. It's like, oh, no, please stop. Don't say that. Oh, yeah. The demands of justice must be satisfied, first of all. That which is already due in justice is not to be offered as a gift of charity. It's a matter of justice. We must, in certain situations, we must. Like if somebody's house burns down, God forbid. And what a terrible thing there. My parents' house was this close away from going down to the ground. All the houses next to it went down to the ground. And the basement of my parents' house got flooded because the fire trucks came with the ladders and all they did was drench. They have a little teeny house and there were these other three-story houses all the way to block down. And four of them went down to the ground. And I was coming, I had to go to the bank and I was going to stop by to make a visit to my parents and I saw all the fire trucks and I saw the smoke and it was right, I was like, oh, I was a nervous wreck. And I went to the telephone and I called my mom and my mom was in the house and she says, we have to leave. I can't talk now because we have to get out, out of the house. Bye. I was like, Wah! I was like, man, I was praying. My heart was going. Bum, 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 bum. I was driving the car. I got out and I just parked the car and I couldn't drive it like for two blocks by. It was all blocked off. It was a very, very bad fire. And I just started running down the street and I couldn't even walk down the block. I almost had a fight with the cop. I was in my habit. I said, my parents' house down here. He says, you can't go down this side of the street. I just ran. <laughs> I just ran by him, you know, to make sure that they were okay. I was a nervous wreck. And I don't know if anybody ever lost, a, you know, goods or a home or even a loved one to a fire. Very terrible thing. And it would not be a work of charity to say, oh, come on in. We could, we could, we could make a little shelter in the living room. Come on. And we can we, I could do the basement. I can take about five people, and I know a few people who can take a few people, and you're organizing. That's not charity. That's justice. That's a matter of justice right there. And hungry people who are hungry. I'm not talking about one of these slick guys, you know, who is saying, uh, I need 50 cents, please. I, I, I need 50 cents, please. A dollar, please. I love going to England. I haven't seen any bums begging over here. But in England, the bums are so polite. It's wonderful. They're like, hello, Father. May I please have a, have a pound, Father? I say, what do you want to do with the pound, my brother? Well, you know, I, I want to get something to eat, Father. I said, well, there's a McDonald's right over there. Do you like hamburgers? And, you know, the guy says, yes, Father. I said, I'll be right out. I'm not going to give him the pound. I'll get him a quarter pound, the hamburger. I'll get him the hamburger. You know, and sometimes I say, oh, Father, I, I make that a Sprite, will you please? All right, good enough. Fair enough. I'll buy him the food. You know? Now, if the guy's really hungry, he's going he's to do that, you know? And then that's... that's could be a matter of justice, not just charity. But if he's out sitting out there drinking, it's more charity than justice in that case. You know? But it's a lot of people that you don't hear about who are really struggling. Right even in New York City, there's a lot of families that we help. And it's not charity. When we give our food distribution, that's not charity. That's justice. These people need this to survive. There's grandmothers taking care of extended families. And they've got so many people in their home. And they really need this little extra food to help them. That's not a matter of charity. That's a matter of justice. And who knows how God is going to use you and involve you. I don't know. And neither do you. The good news is, he does. The question is, will you be willing? That's the question. That's the question. Listen to Pope St. Gregory the Great. Pope St. Gregory the Great. One day we're going to hear that about my hero. I believe that one day he's going to be Pope St. John Paul the Great. No doubt about it. He says this. When we attend to the, to the needs of those in want, we give them what is theirs, not ours. More than performing works of mercy, we are paying a debt of justice. So justice is a main, main key here. The Holy Father Pope John Paul II, when he came to St. Louis in January, 
He said this to American Catholics, but I would like to take the liberty to apply this to all Catholics. He said, today, American Catholics, and I'd like to say today, all Catholics are seriously challenged to know and to cherish the immense heritage of holiness and service. Out of that heritage, you must, must, this ain't me talking now, this is the Holy Father, out of that heritage, you must draw inspiration and strength for the new evangelization so urgently needed at the approach of the third Christian millennium. So we must know and cherish the immense heritage of holiness and service. And he was referring to the tradition of evangelization, conversion, stewardship, Catholic education, and service of those in need, service to those in need. And in all of those many, many different areas, and I see a lot of religious sisters here, and many of their communities are devoted to different works. Who's working the hospital, who does prison ministry, who teaches, who takes care of orphans, who does this, that, and the other thing. Give them a call. And when you help them, you help them. Maybe you could help sister, give, give a sister a ride somewhere. I mean, it could be the smallest little thing. A lot of times when people come in and help us, they wind up sweeping a floor or filling bags with rice, and they think they're going to be out in the front lines. You know, sometimes they're a little disappointed. It's nothing glorious about doing this. I got to tell you something. You know, it's not that if you're looking for glory, forget it. You ain't going to get no glory. What you're going to do is give glory to God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I begin to conclude so that I can stay on time and we can get right into Holy Mass, I want to share with you one of my, uh, one of my favorite uh, lines from the diary of Blessed Faustina. And this may be able to help you because it helps me. Every time I hear this, I get so helped by this. And Jesus is saying to Blessed Faustina and to all of us, my child, know that the greatest obstacles to holiness, you see, because the spiritual and the corporal works of mercy, sisters and brothers, are to sanctify us to help us to grow in holiness. And the greatest obstacles to holiness are discouragement and exaggerated anxiety. <laughs> discouragement and exaggerated anxiety. How am I going to find a hungry person? What am I going to do if I see a homeless person? I don't have clothes to give to the naked person. How am I going to visit the sick? I don't even know if I can get into jail. I don't know how to assist somebody dying. I can't give instruction. I can't advise nobody. I can't counsel nobody. I can't comfort nobody. I can't forgive nobody. And I can't bear wrongs patiently. Take it easy. Take it easy. That's exaggerated anxiety. And it's going to be a major obstacle to holiness. These, Jesus is saying to Blessed Faustina, will deprive you of the ability to practice virtue. These will deprive you of the ability to practice the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. All temptations united together ought not to disturb your inner peace. That bears repetition. All temptations united together ought not to disturb your inner peace. Not even momentarily. Sensitiveness and discouragement are the fruits of self love. You should not become discouraged, but strive to make my love reign in place of your self-love. Have confidence, my child. Do not lose heart in coming for pardon, for I am always ready to forgive you. As often as you beg for it, you glorify my mercy. As often as as you beg for it, you glorify my mercy. Sisters and brothers, let us never tire of crying out for his mercy. I'm, I'm practicing the corporal work of mercy, spiritual work of mercy, what is it? Bearing wrongs patiently. Number five, Peter. 
That was the cue. There it is. second name they are one and the same the remedy for all our sorrow and our pain messianic consciousness beatific vision bliss grow in holiness and a godly righteousness Kyrie Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. This is how we are to live, love like Jesus and forgive, love one another in the power of his name. Jesus didn't say be nice, Jesus died to pay the price, the Lord wants mercy, not a selfish sacrifice. Kyrie, Lord have mercy, 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 Lord have mercy. Learn to turn the other cheek. Yes, I know we are too weak. The Paschal mystery is the power we must seek. The Spirit helps us to be strong, to forgive our neighbor's wrong, and to paradise and sing the saving song. Kyrie. Lord have mercy, 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 Lord have mercy on my family and my friends. Lord have mercy. When I fall, help me get back up on my feet. Time and a time and again, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. When I ask, I glorify Thy love. Yeah, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy.
Amen. God bless you and may the Lord have mercy on you and your family now and forever. God bless you.